All right. Hello and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Perform Colloquium series. Um, in this talk, I'm very, very happy to introduce you to Dr. Pierre-Louis Bazin. Um, Pierre-Louis, I've actually known Pierre-Louis since uh, about 2012. And I'm really, really happy to finally be able to get him to, well, at least virtually, I would, I would prefer if we were in person, but virtually come here and give this talk. Um, and let us know about the, some of the cutting edge work that he's been doing, um, mostly in the subcortex um, with the group in Amsterdam and also with his affiliation in uh, Leipzig in Germany. Um, so Dr. Uh, Pierre-Louis Bazin is a senior researcher in the integrative model-based cognitive neuroscience lab at the psych department in the University of Amsterdam. And he's also uh, a fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, Germany, which is where I met him in 2012. His interests lie in the intersection between cognitive neuroscience, magnetic resonance imaging, and medical image computing, with a particular focus on computational neuroanatomy using advanced MR techniques. And of course, the implications of brain structure for cognitive function and human behavior. Um, so if that sounds like a, a wide and expansive um, set of topics, um, it really is. It's, it's not just words that you know, that, uh, oh, I do the intersection between these things and then, you know, you focus on a little tiny thing. Um, in my experience, Pierre-Louis has a huge, huge, impressive list of publications with touching on all different types of cognition, um, all different types of advanced MR techniques and computational approaches to ask questions that are interesting and innovative uh, in the field. So um, that's how I've known Pilou and uh, Pierre-Louis' uh, work. Um, so before I, I pass the, the baton over to Pierre-Louis, I'd actually like to relate um, one anecdote from one of our early meetings um, that we had <laughs> way back in September 6th or 8th, I believe, of uh, 2012. We were both attending uh, the very first inaugural Brain Hack um, conference, sorry, unconference uh, in Leipzig, Germany. Um, and uh, I was in his office and he was introducing me to some new software tools that he'd been working on. And, and, my, and I remember as a, as a new postdoc, I just started my first postdoctoral position. And as a new postdoc, I was, my mind was just exploding with all of the possibilities of the things you could do with these tools. And I just started getting excited and saying, oh, we could do this and this and this and this and this. And I remember Pilou sort of sitting there very calmly, you know, he has he, he, sort of the, the elder statesman approach, not that you're older, I think, uh, but the statesman approach where, where he, passes, he passes back to me and he says, well, but, but what's the question you're trying to ask? Of course, you can, you can use all of these crazy techniques, you can develop all these crazy techniques, but if you don't have a question that you're asking, um, then it's not important that you just develop the technique. So um, I think that gives, to me, a, a, good, uh, a good essence for um, the development work that Pierre-Louis has done. It's always for purpose. And it's always to ask um, an interesting question or an important question, many times an extremely important question uh, in cognitive neuroscience or in um, brain structure in general. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Pilou. But just before I do, I would like to remind you that all of your questions, so if you have questions throughout, please um, submit those through the Q&A feature. It's down there at the bottom of your screen. Um, don't do it through the chat, please. Uh, please use the Q&A feature and those will go to us. And you can do those at any time, and I encourage you to do so, and then we'll collect those and we'll um, I'll ask those of the speaker at the end. Okay, with that, I would like to introduce you to Pierre-Louis Bazin, and please take the baton. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for a, a very kind introduction and uh, very nice words. I feel a little self-aware. Um, all right. So, um, so it, it's to me, it, it, it's great to be here. Uh, it would be greater to be in person. So I will have to just try to find another excuse and then talk about something else uh, today. So I'm going to try to focus on the um, the, um, the aging of the subcortex, uh, which is something that we've been looking at on and off for quite a few years now. Uh, both with the IMCN group and the, uh, also at the Max Planck and, and really also kind of pushing a few of the, the techniques that we developed recently to really look at them from the mesoscale perspective. So going finer in terms of resolution and also with quantitative models. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll start also with a, with a question of more puzzlements uh, from uh, Heidi Schoenzenberg back in 2013, who said in one of her review papers at the time that one curious feature of many cognitive neuroscience studies is that they focus only on regions of the cerebral cortex, ignoring subcortical or cerebellar structure. This appears to be an accident rather than a deliberate strategy. And indeed, whether you look at uh, very old um, classical work like the maps of Rodman uh, to the uh, latest works in uh, mapping the brain as uh, put in the cover of nature, um, you can see that what we see here have just cerebral cortices. We chopped off everything that's below because cerebellum and brainstem are completely useless. And we put a black hole in the middle because the subcortical stuff, we just don't care about much either. Um, of course, uh, being a little too much on this, but it, it's just one of those things. Once you start putting things on the cortical cerebellum, uh, cerebral surface, you're losing everything else. Um, and it may not be a very good idea because if you start looking at what we know already about the subcortex, for instance, the first thing that is quite surprising is that there is a lot of different structures. Um, so Beate Fortzmann, the head of our group and colleagues um, have uh, counted the number of separate structures that have been defined by neuroanatomists. So it's, it's groups of cells or nuclei or zones or different type of structures, but all of them have a distinctive architecture that makes them separable. We have 455 in the subcortex. If you compare to estimates from either the Vogt and Vogt school or the uh, Glasser and Van Essen paper, we are more around 180 in the cortex. So the scale is similar, but we still have more complexity in that sense in the subcortex. And of course, one of the problem is that it's very difficult to see these things in the um, in vivo case uh, because a lot of those, those structures are small. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of these structures are very important and we've seen that uh, over and over again with deep brain stimulation uh, so an operation where people with very severe disease will get uh, electrode implanted deep into their brain that will be targeting a very specific location and by stimulating it will uh, change completely uh, a whole set of uh, symptoms in neurodegeneration and um, neuro uh, neuropsychiatric diseases and, and those, those traits that are being changed by the uh, deep brain stimulation go from motor tremor to depression to compulsive behavior. So it can be very, very complex and it's a very hard field to, uh, to really understand what is going on because small changes in the location of the electrode, for instance, will have some, some strong effect on how the patient uh, behaves. Now let's go to a completely different field and uh, look at evolution. Um, but from a, an article that I found very interesting looking at the, um, the Neanderthal genome. So we all have genes from the Neanderthal. Um, and so what these researchers did is that they isolated uh, genes that were <coughs> systematically from the Neanderthal in uh, modern humans and look at how much they were down-regulated or up-regulated. So the good news is that they're all down-regulated. Um, but the interesting part is that the regions where they're down-regulated the most are the brain in blue and the um, testes in yellow on the graph. So that was already very interesting. But then if you look at the brain regions that they map, you can see caudate, amygdala, cerebellum, spinal cord, putamen, nucleus accumbens, hippocampus, and then cerebral cortex. 
so clearly those uh, structures have some interest and they're, they're particularly important to define us as humans as opposed to our closest uh, relatives. Uh, taking evolution at a more broad, on a broad more, on a broader level, also looking at things like brain size and number of cells. Uh, the work from Susanna Eichel and Ho Housel has been very impressive to show that the humans, uh, in terms of just kind of the, the general architecture, seem to, to have a lot of neurons in their brains but then they don't necessarily have a bigger cortex and comparing the cerebral and cerebellar cortex, they came to the conclusion that the cerebellum was evolving uh, qu um, quite similarly uh, in terms of trajectory. Uh, other work also in um, human evolution, looking at endocasts of the brain, have also noticed uh, changes in the size of the cerebellum in those regions. So all of this put together, I hope is a bit of uh, an idea that maybe, maybe we should stop looking at the brain as a surface. That is just a, a two dimensional map. We can map a lot of interesting things already on the cortex and we've done it already, uh, but we still have a lot of other things going on. So we have those links between cortical regions. But what we do is, and, and, and we know it also from a lot of anatomical work from Susan Abbas group, for instance, that there's a lot of cortical, subcortical loops going on. And there's a lot of circuitry that is just going up and down. I mean, you have the thalamus to cortex and then back to the striatum for the, the big ones, but you have a lot of different loops going on in different systems as well. There we also have the region that are least Neanderthal. We also have a small pieces in the back that has still 80% of the neuron and that has been growing evolutionarily speaking at the same pace as everything else. So it must be useful for something. And then in the end, most of the deep brain stimulation targets, well, the, the name indicates they're not just top of the cortex stimulation target. So if we want to deal with those, those very intractable symptoms in, in many diseases, it seems going into the subcortex, deep into the brain is really where, where things are happening. So now the question is, well, why, why haven't we really done all this work on the subcortex? Um, or in the cerebellum, but I won't talk about the cerebellum today. Um, well, there are many challenges. Um, I will not talk about the functional challenges, which are also pretty big, but uh, we're still heavily working on it and it's, it's not going as well. Um, but for the anatomy, um, the first thing to, to notice that is fairly obvious is those, those regions are very small. Uh, so if you don't have uh, high resolution images, uh, things like 70, if you cannot go post-mortem, there's a lot of structures that you just cannot map because there's just a few voxels and that's it. The second one that is also tricky is that all these regions are really very tightly packed together. So you have a lot of different structures that have different architecture, that have very different function, that are parts of different subnetworks, and they all just mash together in the middle. And one of the other aspects that is challenging in more practical MRI studies is that if you look at them with the T1 weighted uh, image, uh, you just don't see much. Um, and part of the reason is that in many of these structures, you have um, a lot of myelin and iron, and uh, gray matter and all sorts of different um, uh, MR, MR, uh, sorry, tissue that creates different MR contrasts uh, that interact and that, that make them visible in some but not other contrasts. So if you want to study them, you cannot just get a single anatomical scan. 
you have to start going with multiple contrasts, put them together, analyze them together. Uh, so what can we do with the, on the resolution side? Um, the first step, uh, can we zoom in? Uh, so nowadays, the, uh, the, reco the record that I see personally is the uh, 350 micron quantitative maps from uh, Federal and Galician. Uh, those maps are actually uh, available online, so you can download them and just marvel at the, the beauty of the, the level of detail that they, they manage to, to get. Um, and you can see there's a lot of cortical detail, there's a lot of subcortical details. I don't know if people see my mouse. Yes, okay, great. Uh, but another thing that is to be noted is that we are looking at an average of four sessions of 31 minutes each. So two hours of MRI is a lot uh, for just a single like an anatomical scan. So if we need multiple scan, then we would have to repeat that multiple times. And of course, asking people to stay still in, in chunks of uh, more than 20 minutes is, is really challenging in general. So the, the, one of the first things we did uh, in collaboration with Bit and Svar uh, and Matan Khan was to try to build a, a, a sequence that would be more compact. Uh, so we um, came up with something we call the MP2 Rage Me, uh, which is basically a multi echo version of the MP2 Rage sequence. And the idea is that you acquire multiple images that are interleaved with a, um, a gradient echo with uh, various uh, inversion, um, sorry, inversion angles and various uh, echo times. So you get a lot of information together that will allow you to recover T1 maps, T2 star maps, and QSM maps in one go. Uh, the nice thing about that sequence is that it's very, very efficient in terms of dead time. So you don't have to wait for your system to get back to equilibrium a lot. You have about 6% of the time that's just waiting, uh, which compared to many MRI sequences is very efficient. And so you end up with an acquisition time of 18 minutes for 700 microns resolution. The sequence gives you these uh, 10 types of images. So you have, uh, you have the first inversion, um, which only has one echo, and then the second inversion are four echoes. And the interesting part is that all of these different pieces will be used in different parts of the reconstruction. Um, so the, in red, you get the T1 maps, T2 star map used, so the first one using the two inversions, the second one using the, uh, the four different echoes, and then the quantitative, quantitative susceptibility map uh, using the phase uh, mainly. So with that, we're really using all the data that comes up, which is quite nice. And in that sequence, we can also do one step further because 18 minutes is good, but it's not great. People still move and we still have those problems. Uh, so something that was also developed by uh, Dan Galishan was the idea of fat navigators. So whenever you acquire a slice, you add at the end a little scan that's very, very fast, where you acquire a 3D version of the brain with the, um, just the fat, uh, low resolution. So it's, it doesn't take a lot of time. But from that, then you can reestimate our motion parameters uh, between the different slices. And once you have those, you can use things like a non-uniform Fourier transform instead of just using the grid to reconstruct your data. And so you can get a corrected image where every slice is computed with the uh, information of the motion of the subject. One thing we looked at it, into is was, well, how, how much does that work? Because now we have data that is either corrected or incorrected from the same data set. 
and we can really compare things like the, uh, the sharpness of the boundaries uh, between structures. So we did it in both cortical and subcortical structures in different subjects. And the, the, the main thing is that uh, if it's uncorrected, everybody is moving. Um, you can notice that the value of motion here is actually not very big. It's, it's in the order of the voxel. So it's not that bad, but it's always there. But then the correction actually just removes most of that motion. Um, so we were quite happy with that. Finally, when we increase detail and increase resolution, we have another problem, uh, which is noise, which becomes pretty, uh, pretty evident in the MRI. But if you want to remove noise, the typical approach is to find some way to smooth your data. Um, and if you smooth your data, then you're removing resolution. So how can we do that without uh, changing the resolution? So a, a few years back, there's been a very, very nice paper from um, Bonjon and Coupri uh, on the idea of using a PCA representation on diffusion data uh, to denoise the images. And uh, the idea there was that because you have multiple images that have the same underlying anatomy, but they have different uh, MR properties because they have the different directions of the, the diffusion, then you can look at a PCA decomposition in the dimension of the um, different contrast that you have and use that to dis discriminate what is noise, which will change all the time, and what is structure, which will change only in some of the data in, in a way that is more uh, regular. Uh, so that was quite a, a beautiful uh, approach and it's been uh, integrated in toolboxes like MR Tricks, where it's a uh, standard now. But how do we use that on our data? So there's a few changes, challenges here. Uh, the first one that they have a lot more images, typically 60 directions or more. And in our case, we only have 10 images, half of, we of which are phase images. Um, so we had to do a few changes. Uh, first one was to process the phase to unwarp it and remove all the, the global aspects so that we can get a complex image that has a real and imaginary part. Uh, which is nice because they now have the same kind of uh, noise properties. And then we can um, run that through the same type of algorithm. And, and here, using a, a fairly simple way to threshold it, uh, we tested in simulations the fact that if you don't interpolate, uh, you get uh, uh, cuts in the right place here you have if you have good SNR there if you don't have good SNR but as soon as you start interpolating there's a problem that the, the original methods tended to um, add too many components and so to keep the noise in just in case uh, whereas her method in blue is uh, working a little better so this is how it looks like you have the singular values that show the, the different va um, components of your um, image. And you can see that at first there's a lot of details and some of them are, are fading a little bit. And then the eigenvectors show you the regions of the big changes. So at first you see a lot of boundaries, which is very nice and they're very sharp. And then towards the end, you're just, uh, just looking at noise. So when you reconstruct the images, you just chop for every voxel at the right location. And then you can get these kind of uh, images, uh, which uh, if you compare with the original, have both a lot more smoothness, but also uh, re retain the level of details. Uh, you can see it especially on the air to star map if you look at all the vasculature that is very bright here. We compared it to uh, show that um, we, get a, we get a gain in SNR in the different images that we create. 
but sometimes even more in the actually uh, in the reconstructed maps. So if you look at the, the raw data, we're around 10% improvement. But if you look at the Air One maps, we go all the way to 30, 40, 50 percent, uh, which is quite impressive. But that has to do with the nonlinear uh, combinations of the of the data. Uh, last but not least, uh, the last kind of technology we we needed once that we have once we have good quality, high resolution images, is to be able to label. Uh, cortical uh, subcortical structures as as uh, automatically automatically as possible. Um, so there are a few tools that have been developed, uh, but a lot of them are centered on the striatum, thalamus, and then a few other structures. Uh, so we try to build a new system uh, to really try to to get as many structures as possible. Uh, so far, we've developed. Uh, uh, system for 17 different structures, subcortical, subcortical structures and the ventricles. Uh, it's a Bayesian type of approach where you have a lot of different priors that you put together. So special location from an atlas, and skeletons that try to look at the, the most important part of the shape. You have some, uh, some regularization and then you, uh, you add some, some posterior also based on the uh, sorry, on the volume priors uh, to make sure that you still find the structures, even in noisy data. Uh, we compared it uh, quite extensively uh, on a uh, um, few subjects looking at manual parcellation versus automated parcellations. And we could see that on any metrics from dice overlap, dilated overlap that looks at the overlap plus or minus one voxel, and then the surface boundary distance. Um, we were overall uh, doing pretty well compared to manual delineations. A few of the smaller structures that are the way in the back here were still a little bit more challenging, uh, but we've also made some recent improvement that is uh, helping with a few of those. Finally, now that we have all of that together, we can start looking at our data set. So we developed a uh, database called the HAHED uh, database for Amsterdam Ultra High Field Adult Database. Um, <clears throat> so we try to get a wide age range uh, with uh, about the same number of people in every decade, uh, except for the first one where we just had a lot of um, enthusiastic um, uh, university students who joins the project as well. Um, but for all of them, we got quantitative MRI with a 0 0.7 millimeter resolution and two range me sequence. Uh, we also got a slab at slightly higher, higher resolution in many of them, and also a diffusion scan in about half of the subject. And so with, with that high resolution, and a fairly large, large number, so we have 105 subjects in total, which for seven Tesla is uh, quite large. We were hoping to see a bit of the, the trend on, in those structures that are usually too small for uh, usual databases. So what, what should we expect in terms of aging in the subcortex? Um, so there's a few different things that happens. Uh, we know that myelination and demyelination are uh, two aspects that are ongoing over the lifespan that uh, tend to peak around 30, 40, hopefully we still have, I still have a bit of time and then start going down slowly. Um, there's iron accumulation, uh, especially in disease, but also in normal aging. Uh, of course, also structures tend to shrink slowly over time, so you have atrophy of the nuclei. And also another thing that is quite important for things like deep brain stimulation, they move with regard to each other, so you have shifts of the location of those structures. So in order to look at that, um, we took a little detour because uh, we thought that it's nice to look at those MRI sequences, 
But what we really want is to be able to look at myelin and iron. And we know that MRI sequences, uh, MRI contrasts are uh, related to those quantities. And indeed, from this uh, work from the, from the Max Planck um, by uh, Stuber and colleague, uh, they could show that on a postmodern data set, there was a, a pretty good linear relationship between R1, R2 star, QSM, myelin, and iron. Uh, Ricardo Metteri, also at the Max Planck, who definitely got a lot of things from interacting with people there, uh, went a little further in that um, modeling and uh, found some um, quantitative measurements based on um, uh, um, classical anatomy uh, measures and then could uh, map those in vivo, uh, which uh, was quite interesting. Uh, but a lot of those measurements were uh, not quite enough. Um, there was only a few of them, in, especially in the case of myelin. And so we used data from a, another of our big projects uh, where we are acquiring whole brain um, post-mortem and then performing uh, uh, microscopy systematically to obtain a, a 3D reconstructed version. Um, and we used some of those stains to uh, infer a relative concentration of myelin between structures. So putting all of these things together, we obtained uh, two fairly large tables uh, relating myron, uh, sorry, myelin, iron, QSM, R1, and R2 star measurements in uh, a lot of subcortical and cortical structures. And then we fit them uh, with a linear model, uh, which worked pretty well in both cases. And then based on that linear model, we could then go back from the R1, R2 star, and QSM map and create a myelin and iron map. And the nice thing with those maps is that even though it's a model and there's a lot of assumptions in it and it's imperfect, it, it really disentangles a lot those different measurements. Uh, so you can appreciate, for instance, in the myelin map, how the globus pallidus, uh, both interna and externa, have pretty much the same uh, level of myelination as the striatum or the cortex around them. But because they have so much iron as well, which we can see just next here, then on the MRI of the T1, of the R1 parameters, they just look more like white matter. Uh, so we can really separate all these measurements uh, with that model. Um, another one that uh, I should go very quickly on. Uh, so we were looking at uh, structure volumes. So of course, volume is something that has been reported before. So it's, it's nice to compare, but it's a global measurement. It's very sensitive to noise, especially when you're starting looking at, to look at very small structures. Uh, so we were wondering if we could do something better that would be more akin to cortical thickness. Uh, the answer is yes, you can use things uh, related to medial shape theory. Uh, taking the sine distance function of the structures you're interested in, building a skeleton um, of its interior. And then you can measure the local distance of the uh, where you are to both the skeleton and the boundary. And that gives you a, an estimate of thickness that is localized. Uh, this is not something completely new. It's been um, uh, used uh, quite nicely by uh, Goodman and colleague in a few uh, big studies also on the subcortex. Um, and some of the nice thing is that now that it gives you a more localized uh, information, you can be a bit more robust, but you can also look at localized variations uh, across the lifespan. So now that we've put all these things together, uh, let's see what we see in terms of myelination and demyelination. 
Uh, so we have a lot of structures. Uh, we have a lot of different things. So we're looking here at median and uh, interquartile range of all the different structures in terms of myelin concentration um, cr across the lifespan. So the interquartile range will give you some information about the heterogeneity uh, of the structure. And you can see that it's uh, fairly um, similar in the sense that myelin tends to go down in values in many places. And the uh, interquartile range tends to grow also. Um, you can see that some regions are definitely uh, more active than others. Uh, interestingly, the phonix is a region that is a, a white matter structure. Uh, it has a slightly different type of trajectory as well, which is more likely more um, uh, similar to the one of the white matter bundles. Uh, now, if you look at iron, um, here we have a bit more of a, a different um, view because some structures have a lot of irons and others do not. Uh, and indeed, some structure will be uh, just completely uh, not un unchanging with regards to aging in terms of iron, while others will have very strong uh, increases both in the um, uh, density of iron, but also its heterogeneity across the structure. Now, if we look at the uh, thickness and also volumes, uh, we can see that on top the, um, uh, the ventricles tend to get bigger as we age, uh, which is expected, obviously. And then uh, so some of the other structures also shrink, as triatoms and amygdala, thalamus. Um, some of them are fairly stable as well. Um, so for the smaller structure in particular, it's, it's not as clear. Uh, last, but also not least, and uh, something that we were not expecting entirely is the local shift. Uh, so if we look at how the um, structures are located uh, across age groups, uh, we were expecting that due to ventricular expansion, you would have more uh, spread toward the, the um, exterior part of the brain. But indeed, uh, in, in opposition to that, the main effect was actually a shrinking um, effect. So the, the brain basically going down a little bit, and so the subcortex going also down. So you might have noticed that those results are very complicated, uh, very multifaceted. Uh, so we developed a, an app uh, in order to look at them a bit more in detail, uh, both all together and, and also more separately. Uh, so on top, you can look, for instance, for the different structures and you can see them changing in location or shape or myelination across the lifespan. And below, you can also look at the individual um, trajectories for the different structures. So um, that's uh, about where I wanted to go with this. Uh, so I have two very important conclusions. The first one, I hope I convinced you that subcortical structures are important. If I didn't, uh, last year in March, we hosted a uh, very nice um, online workshop with a lot of, uh, um, of the big uh, researchers in the field of the subcortex and a lot of those uh, talks are online. So you can have a look at those. Uh, and I would argue from uh, our experience uh, that really multimodal ultra field MRI here is really key in terms of studying those uh, structures uh, in vivo. So here I want to thank the, the team. Uh, I showed a lot of work that was uh, 
a collaboration between a lot of different people. Uh, in particular, I would like to outline a uh, few people. So uh, Matan Khan, who's been really uh, very instrumental in developing the MR sequence, but also testing it and looking at motion and denoising and all these things. Uh, Max Koeken, who's uh, started a bit of the, um, the anatomical uh, aging um, research with uh, different data sets before. Uh, Anneke Alkamada, who's been building all her uh, anatomical uh, definitions on all this data, which is a, a ton of work. And lastly, Stephen Militic, who has been doing uh, a lot of the um, modeling in the aging data and then all the beautiful work also with the app and everything. And of course, Peter Fortzman has been uh, getting all these ideas uh, off the ground and, and funding us so that we were able to acquire that data to start with. Uh, the last slide for me will be uh, Light point, a small point that I, I really like to make every time is that open science is also a very important thing to do. Uh, so we try to do it ourselves as much as possible. Uh, so that means releasing our data, uh, putting our database entirely online, freely accessible, uh, putting our things like our subcortical viewer uh, accessible and you can download the data there as well and also developing all the tools in toolboxes like NIRES, uh, where we try to integrate them in a format that people can reuse in their own research. Um, with that, uh, I'm done for the talk and thank you for your attention. I see we've lost Christopher. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, I will see if we can get him back. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to invite participants to uh, ask their questions to the Q&A feature. We do have one question at the moment. I will read that out. Was there a study based on flaws, fluid and white matter suppression? Any idea? Will that also give good distinction of structures that is also based on MP2 rage? Yes, so there's, there's been a lot of different approaches to look at, at, at increasing contrasts uh, with the subcortical structures in particular. Um, I personally like the uh, quantitative MRI angle because it, it gives you the quantitative values. So in theory, you could take those and plug them back in with a model for any kind of sequence, and then you regenerate that data as well. Um, so from that, you get kind of the, the, the building blocks to create uh, MRI sequences. Of course, in some cases, of, you, you can go faster by acquiring directly the, the contrast you would want, and that would be good. But in, in many cases for the subcortex, the problem is you don't want the same contrast for all the different structures. And that makes it uh, a bit of a problem. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, it might be a very simple question, but I wonder if these subcortical structures have their own metabolic activities. And if yes, would it be possible to employ MR spectroscopy in mapping these regions? Uh, yes, absolutely. That would be uh, fantastic. Um, so yes, they, they definitely have very different uh, metabolic activity. So some regions are part of the dopamine network, so some on the nor noradrenergic networks. So there's, there's a lot of different, um, different functions that are, that are quite different and the, the structures as well. Um, we've been looking a little bit um, at that from, a, from another angle, looking at uh, vasculature. Uh, which also has uh, the density of vascularization in the subcortex is also quite interesting and different in the organization from the, the one in the, in the cortex. 
uh, uh, MR spectroscopy would be would be great, but what what is still a problem uh, to to my eyes is that the spectroscopy voxels are still pretty big compared to the structure we're looking at. So if you think about the STN, which is a I would say a medium size structure in the um, in the subcortex, it's about a, a bean of this size. So not even a, a white bean but, or a red bean, but something a little smaller. Uh, so we need to be able to put uh, enough voxels in, in those and to be sure that we're looking inside the structure and not having too much partial volume as well. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, how do you quantify the vasculature in the subcortex since you have a lot of interference from higher iron? Yes, that is very difficult to do, I agree. Um, so one thing we've been looking at is to, uh, to look more at the R2 star contrast. Uh, we started up with a QSM contrast, which is a, a great way to, to go and to really go specifically to, to target the veins. Uh, but with the R2 star, you also have, uh, so you have contributions from both veins and arteries, which is a bit of a problem but you also get uh, a slightly better uh, definition in those. And in some cases, not always, uh, they tend to be even more intense than the regions they are passing through when there's iron. Pulling those two away from each other automatically is still a challenge and we're not there yet. Thank you. I see Christopher is back with us, so I will let him take over the remaining questions. Sorry, uh, kicked off the network. Um, I'm trying to reconnect, but uh, um, the next question here is from Dr. Benami. And um, have you compared the segmentation of subcortical structures from high images, high image resolution, and the atlas of Eric Bardenay and Jerome Yelnick? that you mentioned in the presentation previously? Not directly because um, um, we don't have the, the, the data in 3D. Uh, we've looked at a few comparisons. We've done comparisons with uh, free surface segmentation, for instance, uh, which are basically outlining the same, well, a subset of the same structures. Uh, but in, in their case, because they have to do the, the whole brain, their uh, resolution is much closer. Um, we've been trying to, to compare with other atlases in some specific cases. For instance, we looked at the uh, VTA, the ventral tegmental area, uh, where there's quite a lot of variability in how people define it. And so you get different atlases because you have different definitions, which is also an, another problem. Um, but then getting a, a lot of atlases that are defined um, in 3D on, on a lot of different subjects is not that easy still. I think it, it, it is improving very rapidly, thankfully, but it's still a lot of work to harmonize also between different types of scans. Because if you look at quantitative MRI on one hand and T1 and T2 weighted images, on the other hand, you're in somewhat different worlds as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have another question here about um, whether or not you've thought about using other types of contrasts, like in an MRI fingerprinting type of an approach. Yeah, so fingerprinting would be great because you, you know, in theory, you can get everything at once. Uh, it's uh, it's fairly challenging from what I understand on the physics side. Uh, it's also fairly challenging to convince uh, MR physicists to have it run on a scanner because so some of them have a lot of issues with the various type of uh, approximations made in different cases. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great technique uh, to, to try to have. Um, so with the uh, MP2 Rage Me, we are basically trying a kind of a simplified version of this that has also some assumptions, bits 
uh, lighter, hopefully, uh, but they're also not, not great in that and there's a lot of artifacts and problems to go with. Uh, another approach would be the multi-parametric maps, um, which I've uh, particularly developed by uh, Nick Weisskopf now at uh, Max Planck in Leipzig. And there you get also a, a nice subset, but you don't get the same one. So you get uh, magnetization transfer and proton density, uh, but uh, so far they haven't really gotten a QSM to work properly. I know they're working on it though. So hopefully at some point we'll have one sequence that is all the at least simple MR parameters. Thank you. And another um, that sort of brings a, a follow-up question from the audience as well about the MP2 Rage Me uh, that I would also like to tack on to here. Um, the, the first one is uh, what, um, what platforms is the MP2 Rage Me available for? Um, so the, the version we have is uh, built on a Philips scanner, uh, where you can basically uh, piece together a MP2 rage and a multi-echo uh, readout with uh, putting, like, really manipulating them together. You can also do them on a Siemens scanner by uh, acquiring the multi-echo train on both inversions. So it takes a bit longer. It's a bit less efficient and you have data that is a bit more redundant. Uh, but that's what uh, Ricardo Meteri and colleague uh, developed, for instance. And I know other people are using them as well. As well. And then my, my follow-up question on the mp 2 me is, is a little bit more about the processing. So one of the images that you showed showed a really nice um, identification of boundaries. I think it was in the first eigenvector. I think that's what that was yep. the piece. So have you explored or thought about using that as a potential for or with potential for a segmentation or just white matter, gray matter, boundary identification kind of thing? Yes, so you can you can look at it that way. Um, it sounds like a good idea. Um, there's, there's so there's yeah there's a, a few issues when you start going into gradient. Basically, you're looking at gradients. Um, so when you get into gradient domains, the issue is that the flat region of signal that is below is actually interesting to tell you if what you started from. So sometimes um, making those simplification that just gives you the edges is nice, but it also can remove information that might be useful. So I'm not sure what would be really the best. Okay, so um, you, you get some accolades here. Thank you for the great presentation. This is from Ali. Um, so there's two questions here. What is your opinion about using MP2 Rage Me, ME in a 3T with desired resolution, something like point half a millimeter? Is that possible um, by using a type of radial acquisition? And then the second question, which I can repeat again afterwards, is in general, does QSM results help to increase the quality of the myelin maps? Yes, yeah, so that's that's quite interesting. The uh, so for the first question, um, that would be very interesting to try. I know that radial acquisition gives you a, a lot of speed that you can then use to, to, to get higher resolution. Um, of course, then you end up with a lot of noise, especially at 3T, but there that might be very interesting that uh, you can remove a lot of that afterwards because of the, uh, the redundancy in the images. Uh, so using things like the, the PCA approach I, I mentioned. Um, so that, that I think that would be really worth worth a try um, with the QSM and the myelin map. So we found interestingly that um, myelin was very heavily represented by R1. Um, iron was more represented by R2 star, and QSM contributed a little bit in both sides and. So we had, we had basically, if, if you want to do the very simple model, you say, well, R1, uh, myelin, R2 star, iron. But 
it's a little bit more complicated and we, we compared a lot of different models. So using all of them together, using just one, two, adding nonlinear components. And in the end, a linear component with uh, two pieces for each uh, was the one that, that was the simplest and explaining the data best. Uh, what kind of system requirements is necessary to have the MP2 rage protocol? And he's um, just asking if it's possible to have it on the 3T system. So here we have the, uh, the G system. I'm sorry, you've been cutting a lot. A lot. Sorry. Uh, just asking about the requirements for the um, on the 3T for the MP2 yeah. rage. If that's uh, simple enough to go. Well, if you can, so if you can get an MP rage uh, by default, you should be able to get an MP rage with different inversion times, and so you can you can build an MP rage out of this. The tricky part, of course, is that if if you use the MP two rage me approach and we develop, the nice thing is that you have everything interlaced. So you're mm -hmm. looking at the same part of the brain with all the different contrasts one after the other. You're not losing time and you're, you're also making sure that motion will not be an issue too much because you're not moving too much between the scans. On the other end, you can also take all these images and kind of acquire them separately. So you could do a, a set of two MP images and then some uh, gradient echo or flash images with a, different TEs and that should give you the same data that you can then use in, this, in the model. And we, we put the, the tools to build the model also online in IRES. So you can, you can input those data sets in there and it doesn't have to come from uh, different, from, from the specific sequence that we've been using. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have another question here from Dr. Emily Coffey who thanks you for the talk. Um, so as a cognitive neuroimaging researcher, I noticed that uh, the cortical centricity of existing work, what do you think needs to happen to convince researchers who are not focused on the subcortex or specific structures to better integrate them? Is it about better tools and toys or more of a paradigm shift? Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, so better tools and toys definitely help a lot. Um, and it's, I mean, it, it's interesting, but if you cannot do something technically, you're not going to ask the question. And that's always hard because sometimes you want to ask the question and so you have to build the techniques. Uh, but if the techniques is there and you just have to, to, to grab the tool and press a button and, and you get a result, then obviously you will consider it more easily in your, in your research. So I think developing those tools, uh, and at least that's my belief and then my hope that it will help people get more interested. Um, and also showing them that there's things that we cannot really well understand with just cortical models that require subcortical loops and uh, subcortical involvement and showing in particular in, in disease how subcortical structures tend to be the one that are first and more easily impacted and then the cortex has problems. Uh, so in, in Alzheimer's disease there's been recent works showing that the locus corridoris for instance is getting um, some very early signs of degeneration and you also have it in uh, Parkinson's disease uh, in some extent as well. So there, there is definitely sign that the subcortex at least on the clinical side is very important uh, and so looking at these two angles, I think the subcortex will, will hopefully get a bit more interest and, and also because there's more possibility, people will start including them into their cortical maps. We just need to find a good subcortical mapping technique so that we can plot things on a nice surface view and put them in papers. Great. 
Um, thank you. So Dr. Alam um, is asking another question here. Among the TDK, Cosmos, ILSQ, and MEDI, which analysis algorithm was used for QSM with your, uh, with your approach? So here we used the, um, I'm blocking in it. Um, it's a cool box in Python, which was one of the main reasons to use it. It's TGV QSM. Uh, so with total generalized variation. Uh, one thing I liked from it is that it's a, it's a one-step method. Uh, so it, it does all the uh, kind of pipeline in, in one go. Uh, and it runs in Python, which makes it practical in a lot of uh, toolboxes. Um, that's it. I, I know the, there's a lot of different algorithms. Um, they all have strengths and weaknesses. But for purposes, it's very difficult to, to assess which ones are really better. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. And um, so I, I actually just want to ask one last question before we let everybody go. Um, and that's uh, the role of white matter. Um, so you, di you didn't sort of touch on any type of connectivity type of parcellations of the subcortical structures or anything like that. Where do you see or do you see that coming in play in the future? And is your group also thinking about that, looking at that? Yeah, so white matter is definitely very interesting. So in the structures we looked at, uh, so we have the fornics and the uh, internal capsule that have been kind of separated uh, and they show some uh, white matter type of uh, evolution. So the myelin goes up and then down, uh, the iron doesn't really change. And then uh, they also start to um, atrophy a bit. Um, white matter is definitely a big part of the system. And it's, it's particularly interesting if you think of it, uh, looking at things like plasticity and, and aging from the angle of plasticity, where a lot of the changes that happen in the lifetime are first happening in, in terms of the, the axonal um, connections. And, and then more happening in the, in the neurons later on. Um, so it, it's a place to look at. The tricky part is to find the proper definition of the subcortical white matter bundles, because ideally you would want to be able to separate bundles that are linking the VTA to the striatum from the one from the substantia nigra to the striatum which are very close. And we've started looking into that. Uh, it's very challenging with the, the type of resolution we currently have with diffusion MRI, uh, but we are trying. Great. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like to just take this opportunity to, again, thank you for a fantastic talk. And uh, thank you for coming to attend uh, the talk here in Concordia Virtual. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you all. Have a good day.